the aim of this lecture is to introduce the subject of pharmacology. Now, etymology is the study of the origin of words. So the etymology of pharmacology becomes clear if we split pharmacology into a suffix and a prefix. Okay, so if we split pharmacology as a prefix and a suffix, like so, pharmaco and logi, and we look at the origin of these words, we find pharmaco is derived from the Greek word pharmacon. And logi is derived from the Latin word logio. Now, pharmacon means a remedy. Logia means study of. So in our context, remedy refers to drugs. And so if we contract um, these two words, we find that pharmacology is the study of drugs. Okay. So drug, again, it comes from the French word it comes from this French word dohoge. Okay. So that means drugs as we know it. So let's take an example of a medicine, say Tylenol. Okay, so this is a trade name. So the generic name of Tylenol the active ingredient of Tylenol is acetaminophen. So this is the generic name. Now if we draw the structure of acetaminophen, it is a phenol derivative, so this is phenol, and at the para position you have an amino group, okay, so the, um, there is an amino derivative at the para position of the phenol. And there is an acetyl group here. So the chemical name would be N acetyl at the para position, para 
amino phenol. Okay, so if we look at this, we will understand why it is named acetaminophen. Okay, acet amino fen. Okay, so that is how the generic name is derived, and this is the chemical name. So we talk this Tylenol is a medicine. What does it do? What is the use of this uh, acetaminophen? It is a analgesic antipyretic drug. Okay, it is analgesic and antipyretic. What is analgesic? Analgesic is something that reduces pain. Okay, so analgesic reduces pain. What is antipyretic? It reduces fever. Okay, or it reduces uh, temperature when the temperature is elevated over normal. All right, so this is a medicine given for uh, to bring about analgesia and uh, reduction in pyrexia. Okay, so this is a medicine. The active ingredient in this medicine, the actual chemical compound that brings about analgesia and reduction in temperature is n acetyl paraaminophenol. So this active principle, we call it an API. API meaning it is an active pharmaceutical ingredient. Okay. So does Tylenol contain only paraacetaminophenol? No. Tylenol, let's say it's a tablet. So this tablet, say, this is a tablet. This tablet is called a dosage form. Okay. So acetaminophen is made into a tablet, into a dosage form. Okay. For that, we need inactive ingredients. And these are called excipients to make it into a dosage form. So an API plus inactive ingredients okay, goes into making a dosage form. Okay, this combination goes into making a dosage form. Okay, so what does the dosage form contain? It contains the API and the excipient. A dosage form is what we refer to as medicine. Okay, so what is medicine? Medicine is basically a dosage form, okay, which contains the drug. So now we know the difference between medicine So let us recapitulate again. Medicine is a dosage form. The drug is the active chemical component in the medicine that brings about the effect of the drug, the pharmacological effect. So what does medicine contain? Medicine contains the active pharmaceutical ingredient and inactive ingredients, which we call excipients. Okay? Let us define a drug. Let's formally try to define what is a drug. So 
So, a drug, a drug is an agent. intended for use use in the diagnosis mitigation treatment or preventing a disease in humans or other animals. Okay, so this is the working definition of a drug. Okay. But as far as the legal enforcement of the drug laws is concerned, there is a definition, a legal definition of the drug, which is usually the definition um, mentioned in the pharmacopoeia, which is um, a book containing the official drugs in a particular jurisdiction, in a particular country. Okay. So this is not the legal definition, but this is a working definition. A drug is any agent which is intended for diagnosis, mitigation, treatment, cure, or preventing a disease in humans or other animals. Okay, so now let's explore the question, why are drugs administered as dosage forms? Okay. So why are drugs administered as dosage forms. Now, dosage forms in common parlance we call medicine. Okay, so, why are drugs administered as dosage forms? Okay, let's take an example. Suppose this is a, a glass jar Suppose this is a glass jar containing acetaminophen. Okay. Okay, the active ingredient of Tylenol. So let's say this jar contains acetaminophen. So what is the physical property of this drug? It is a white crystalline slightly bitter odorless powder. Okay. And suppose the prescription or the patient is asked to take 650 milligram per day okay as a you as at one time okay now for a patient to accurately measure 650 milligrams would be rather difficult secondly this powder is not very palatable. Okay. So, um, the patient might not comply with the prescription because the, um, the drug itself is not very palatable. Okay. So, in this case, if we got, uh, say, a unit dosage form in the form of a blister pack, okay. So we have seen uh, packs like this. Okay. 
Okay, so um, imagine this is a blister pack of um, Tylenol, which so inside this blister pack you have the tablet. Okay, so this is the blister pack of the tablet dosage form. Okay, so now you, if we think about this, this powder is formed into a tablet. And what does this tablet do? It does lots of things. It uh, protects. Okay, protects the drug, which is the API, from the atmosphere. atmosphere. Okay, so the atmosphere will contain humidity, it will contain dust. Okay. So the tablet in uh, a packaging protects the drug from the atmosphere, from the and then ultraviolet light. Okay, so these are all variables in the environment. Now, some of the variables in the environment that can actually interfere with the uh, chemical structure of acetaminophen. Okay. So, a dosage form basically protects the um, drug from the um, atmosphere. And we have talked that uh, the dose, so there can be accuracy of the dose. Um, suppose there is uh, a drug that is very potent, like say, estradiol. Let's take an example. Estradiol. Okay, so this is a female hormone. Estrogen. Okay, so this has got uh, a dose of, this is given as a point, uh, uh, I'm sorry. 0.05 milligram is the dose. Not 0.05 milligram. Now, if you think about it, this 0.05 is too small a dose to be handled by the patient. Okay. Assume that uh, the patient can weigh it, but this might be less than the least count of the weighing machine that uh, the patient may have. And so it becomes very, very difficult to handle small quantities. Now, this 0.05 grams, can you form it into a tablet? Certainly not. Okay, you need excipients. You need excipients. So here, what will the excipients do? It will increase the bulk. Okay, so that uh, a tablet which can be handled readily. Okay say, uh, 100 milligram tablet can be made. Okay, so, this 100 milligram tablet will contain only about 0.05 milligram of the estradiol. But, uh, because of the excipient which is added to increase the bulk, it can be easily handled by the patient and can be again made into a blister pack and be dispensed to the patient. Okay, so, um, this is another reason why drugs are administered as dosage forms rather than drugs themselves. Okay, so it protects from the atmosphere. Um, another variable in the atmosphere is definitely oxygen. Okay, oxygen might oxidize the drug. Okay, so these are the most important variables in the environment. Okay, the other thing is some drugs by acid in the stomach. So if you make a dosage form with a coating, so you take a tablet, suppose this is a tablet, if you give the tablet by itself, then it will be degraded by the acid in the stomach. But if you can coat it, you can give it a coating. If you give it a coating, okay, uh, then that coating can protect it from the effects of uh, the acid in the 
stomach. So these type of tablets which are coated to prevent the acid from degrading it, they are called enteric coated tablets. Enteric coated. So this enteric coating, it cannot be degraded by the acid, but it can be degraded in the uh, intestine where the pH is more in the alkaline range. Okay, but it will be protected from the um, acid in the stomach. So the tablet, enteric coated tablet, will not disintegrate integrate in the stomach. Okay, because the enteric coating will protect it from the acid, but it will disintegrate in the uh, intestine. Okay, it will disintegrate in the intestine. Okay, so that is the reason why some drug, drugs are formulated as enteric coated drugs. Okay, let's look at this uh, physical characteristic of Tylenol. Okay, it is slightly bitter. Okay, it is slightly bitter, so it is not very palatable. It's not, um, you know, very much accepted by the uh, patients, okay, because it's not a very pleasant taste. And so, when we make it into a dosage form, it becomes more palatable, okay. And think about giving this to pediatric patients. So, it might be very, very difficult, okay. But if it is made into a dosage form, like a very brightly colored and flavored liquid dosage form, like a syrup, then it will be more accepted by the um, pediatric population, right? So that is another reason why drugs are administered as dosage forms. Okay. And then dosage forms enable one to administer the drug into certain areas of the body. Suppose you want to um, insert it into the vagina. Okay, then we got dosage forms like pessaries, okay, which will enable us for, uh, to be inserted into the uh, orifices okay, or uh, rectal preparations like enema. Okay, if uh, enema has to be administered, what is it administered? Into the rectum. Okay, so in the vagina, we have got pessaries. In the rectum, we got enemas. Okay, so it enables one to reach the drug into in an acceptable form into the body orifices. Then some drugs, if you formulate it into an injection, okay, so you can give it intravenously into the systemic circulation. Circulation directly. So if you want to inject something directly into the blood, you can give it, you have to formulate it as a soluble dosage form, okay? Or with particle size, very, very small. And it can be injected intravenously into the systemic circulation directly, okay? So again, you need to make it into a soluble form with very, very, if it is not a homogeneous mixture, the particle size should become very, 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 very small. Okay, but then that is a dosage form. Okay, and then sometimes by using an appropriate coating. Okay, so one of the coatings we have talked about is enteric coating. There are other coatings, other coatings that can be used to um, vary the rate of uh, the um, administration, okay? So we can use other coatings for rate control. Okay, meaning how much of the drug is entering into the blood. Suppose we give an enteric coated tablet. So that tablet will be disintegrating and dissolving at a very predetermined rate. And that can control the amount of drug that gets into the blood. So, by using other coatings, we can control the rate. 
Okay, so we have a controlled release tablets. So by another bit of coating, you can we can control the uh, rate release, the control the drug release. Okay, so control release tablet release the active ingredient at a controlled rate, which is predetermined. Okay, so these are some of the many reasons why a drug is not administered as a drug but as a dosage form. Okay. Okay. So now let's look at what are the different dosage forms. Dosage forms may be classified say, dosage forms may be classified on the basis of their physical form, on the basis of their route of administration, on the basis of their method of manufacture. According to their physical form, they may be They might be semi-solid or they may be liquid or gas or they may be gas so according to their physical form. So what would be these examples of um, solid dosage forms? Yes, if you said tablet, you're absolutely right. So solid forms can be tablets, they can be capsules, they can be granules, can be powders, or um, film dosage form. Um, or many other types of um, solid dosage forms. So we are taking a very small group um, as example. Um, Semi-solids are ones which uh, are not solids, they can kind of flow. And the examples would be ointments, it can be creams, they could be pastes or they could be gels. Okay, so these are semi-solids okay, because they are not as rigid as the solid dosage forms. And liquid, we are all very familiar with. Liquids can be solutions. Uh, when it is a monophasic one, and if it's biphasic, it can either be suspensions or they can be emulsions. Okay. And there are subdivisions of this. So you can have uh, oil in water, water in oil emulsion. You can have uh, multiple emulsions and so on and so forth. And gas to be inhalations okay 
or medical gases like uh, oxygen, uh, carbogen, etc. Okay. So medical gases are examples of gaseous dosage forms. Now, according to the route of administration, say we give special names. So if it's um, oral, as we mentioned, we have tablets, capsules, okay? Tablets, capsules, uh, we have uh, granules, okay, and uh, powders. And uh, liquids can also be administered, yeah, solutions, the elixir, etc. Okay, they can be administered per oral. Can be administered per oral. They can be given orally. And uh, if we want to give them as uh, injections, we call it parenteral. Parenteral. Okay. Enteral comes from the word enteron, meaning the intestine, the gut. Are enteral, so beside the uh, enteron, beside the gut, which is parenteral road of administration. And so, what are the dosage, parenteral dosage forms? They can be injections. Okay, so injections can be administered at uh, different routes. So, um, if they are administered uh, into the veins, they are called intravenous. Okay, so it can be intravenous, it can be intramuscular, yeah. and uh, um, intramuscular usually it is administered to the um, uh, gluteus muscle, you know. And the deltoid muscle. Okay, so intra those are intramuscular routes um, by which they are injected. Now injections themselves can be solutions. They can be suspensions, emulsions, etc. Suspensions. Um, they can be emulsions. So usually, solutions are only administered intravenously. So the most common ones are, which are given intravenously are solutions. Though some suspensions and emulsions are given, but the particle size needs to be controlled. Otherwise, they can occlude the smaller blood vessels. Okay, so those are parent. Then let's look at uh, some topical dosage forms. Topical. topical dosage forms, meaning they are administered locally to the skin for a local action or for systemic action. So topical could be ointments, ointments, they could be creams, um, they could be pastes. could be lotions, gels, or solutions, or sometimes, for example, for muscle pain, we administer aerosols. Okay. Um, they can also be patches, you know, like nitroglycerin patches or uh, contraceptive patches, okay. So they are mm, 
administered topically. Now, you, they can also be used for systemic action. So, for example, patches, they are for systemic. Most of these are for local action, meaning at, at a localized area of the um, skin. Um, then uh, we can have uh, uh, those stage forms which are administered into the eye. Mm, they can be solutions can be ointments or injections. Sometimes some injections are administered. So what about the ear? Again, ear, we can have uh, aerosols. There can be solutions. Okay. Um, what about uh, nose or the nasal route? Again, solutions are administered. Okay, normal saline solutions are usually administered to pediatric patients to relieve the blockage nasal solutions and then inhalations. Um, what about the lung? Lung again, uh, there can be aerosols. Again, um, again that aerosols can be Solutions can be suspensions, or they can be powders like uh, dry powder inhalations. Okay. Um, can also be uh, sprays, and as we said uh, previously, gases, medical gases. Okay. Inhalations. Mm -hmm. mm, what about uh, rectal or vagina? Um, rectal or vaginal, we can have uh, rectal, we have enemas. Um, we can uh, suppositories. Suppositories, you know, for uh, local action, sometimes for systemic action. So local action is for maybe the inflammation of the rectum, and systemic would be maybe for uh, nausea. Okay. So as and when we look at the drugs, we will look at examples. Um, and there can be ointments. Creams, I okay, guess, so rectal or vagina. So specifically, vaginal would be an example. Would be a pessary. Pessaries, okay. Pessaries are usually dosage forms, meant for insertion into the uh, vaginal cavity. Okay. Um, yeah. So according to the method of manufacture. Let's bring this up here. Okay. Uh, let's connect the slides. And uh, let's take According to the method of manufacture, meaning uh, 
according to how it is being processed during manufacture, they can be they can be sterile dosage forms or they can be non-sterile. Okay, so according to the method of manufacture. Okay, in addition, there are novel dosage forms. Novel uh, dosage forms. Okay, novel meaning uh, new, which are just in the experimental stages. So this is a rough classification of how dosage forms um, can be classified. So we have seen it can be classified in the, based on its physical form. Okay, it can be classified based on the route of administration. Okay, they can be classified based on the method of manufacture. And then there are novel dosage forms. This is how we classify dosage forms. Okay. As why, why is this important? So as healthcare providers, we are going to encounter lots of dosage forms. Okay. So the, the, the dosage forms which are available commercially, it's a comprehensive list and I have listed it out here. So this is a list of the commercially available dosage forms which as healthcare providers we will be encountering. So this is quite, uh, this is the official list. Okay. So all these are names of dosage forms which are now commercially available. So these dosage forms, we can classify based on this scheme that we have just discussed. Okay, for example, uh, for example, say, the solid dosage forms can be um, tablets. Tablet is a solid dosage form. Okay, pill is a solid dosage form. Uh, uh, capsule, a familiar example of us, solid dosage form. Okay, and then there are lots of um, other solid dosage forms as well. Okay, for example, an injection powder. Okay, before it is reconstituted, it is a solid dosage form. Okay. Then, as we mentioned, uh, there are granules are um, solid dosage forms. Okay. And so these dosage forms, the official list, can be classified according to the scheme that we have discussed. But it, it, it's helpful for us as healthcare providers to know that these are the dosage forms which are available commercially um, and for which um, uh, prescriptions are usually written. Now that we have seen the dosage forms um, or the medicines above, they contain the active pharmaceutical ingredients. So these dosage forms, dosage forms which we have seen above contain APIs, okay, the active pharmaceutical ingredients. Therefore, it would be instructive for us to learn about the source of, of drugs or the APIs. So drug sources can be classified as 
natural sources semi synthetic sources or purely synthetic okay so there are natural sources of drugs some drugs are derived semi synthetically and some drugs are purely synthetic in nature hmm? okay so let's look at natural products so when we say natural products we mean um, which are um, obtained from nature okay so natural sources when we mean we say they are obtained from nature so from nature we have uh, basically two types uh, we have uh, natural products which is abbreviated np and we have uh, mineral sources natural products and we have mineral sources okay. so what are natural products so natural products are obtained from living systems okay so they are usually they are usually secondary metabolites okay so to understand secondary metabolites uh, we need to digress a bit and talk about primary metabolites so primary metabolites um are uh, metabolites which are involved um they are directly involved involved in the um normal growth and reproduction okay so what are primary metabolites primary metabolites are metabolites which are directly involved in the normal growth and development can we have examples examples of primary metabolites yes it can be carbohydrates lipids proteins okay so those are usually the primary metabolites so what are secondary metabolites then so secondary metabolites are not required for normal growth and reproduction okay but they are produced in the organism produced in the organism which gives them some advantage in the in their niche okay so in their environment the production of secondary metabolites gives them some survival advantage okay so that is the reason why organisms yes. produce secondary metabolites okay so that is the reason why um secondary metabolites are a source of drugs because uh, they do not interfere with the uh, primary metabolites okay 
so that is why uh, they are kind of uh, more they are selective okay they might not be interfering with the primary metabolite or their pathways okay so which makes them um, have selective effects okay and they would be more safe because they don't interfere with the uh, primary metabolism so the side effects would be less so the um, secondary metabolites of natural products are usually the source of drugs okay so we said they are obtained from living systems what are the living systems so the living systems could be classified as prokaryotes okay so what are prokaryotes yes prokaryotes don't have a well defined nucleus or they can be eukaryotes okay so they have a well defined nucleus so then the examples of uh, prokaryotes would be archaea uh, it can be bacteria and eukaryotes can be fungi um it can be plants it could be animals okay it could be fungi it could be plants or it could be animals now the plants can be terrestrial or they can be marine okay similarly animals um can also be terrestrial or marine okay so they can be terrestrial or marine thank you and so they may also be the source may also be cells which are derived from plants or animals okay so the source can also be can also be cells derived from plants or animals okay do we have examples um yes um now for example cells of um atropa belladonna Okay, so what is this? What is this cells? The source of they are the source of atropine. And what about animals? We have uh, cells like uh, CHO. What is CHO? Chinese hamster ovary cells. Okay. Um, um, so the drugs which are derived from um chinese hamster ovary we will be discussing when we uh, discuss the examples okay so we'll come back to this just hold on to that thought okay now very few drugs are derived from natural products okay uh, few drugs drugs are derived from from natural products okay. what are we talking of the natural products are what the natural products are the drugs which are obtained from living systems okay so there are very few drugs which are derived from natural products in some examples let's look at um so before that let's ask ourselves why very few drugs are derived from why very few drugs are derived from natural products so there are many reasons um so one there are uh, the reasons could be issues related to 
availability. in commercial quantities. Okay, so there could be issues related to available, availability in commercial quantities. Maybe it's available in very less um, uh, amount or maybe the concentration of the drug itself in the natural product is not commercially viable. So it could be any of those reasons. And then it is seen in natural products that there is a seasonal variation. Okay, so the concentration of the natural product in the organism is subject to seasonal variation, which means the uh, yield might be different across the seasons. So that could be another reason why we have few drugs derived from natural products. Uh, the other reasons could be um, environmental concerns. Okay, so uh, we have one of the largest uh, biodiversity hotspots is the Amazon rainforest. Now, if we try to deplete the natural products, which are natural products, the plants which are present in the Amazon rainforest, then that can cause that can have uh, environmental ramifications. So that could be one of the reasons why we have few drugs from the uh, from natural products. Or as we previously alluded to, the yield might be poor. Okay, which might not make economic sense. Okay, so this might they, it might all be related to economics. So um, those are the reasons why very few drugs are derived from natural products. But having said that, when we say few drugs are derived from natural products, it means natural products are also the source of some drugs. So what could be the reason? Why are natural products um, still being used as drugs? So it has got certain advantages. It's got certain advantages. One is that it has evolved. Okay, so the secondary metabolite has evolved. See the secondary metabolite has evolved over time. Meaning, uh, the organism is producing a secondary metabolite. So that secondary metabolite should not be toxic to itself. So evolution has uh, um, given the ability to the organism to separate the action of the secondary metabolite from the primary metabolic pathway. Okay, but this secondary metabolite might be absolutely toxic to another organism or another pathway. So that is what we are trying to exploit. Um, the other reason is that the structure of these drugs is very complex. Okay. So meaning there is greater diversity. There is multitude of chemical structures. So if we have uh, increase in diversity, it means we might have these uh, drugs binding to different drug targets. So that is an advantage. Now, the diversity in um, the normal way that we derive chemicals, which is by combinatorial synthesis, okay, combinatorial synthesis at its uh, basic level is uh, making derivatives of drugs from a single backbone. Okay. But when that symbol, the backbone also needs to be simple. And therefore, the number of compounds that is generated is really huge, but it lacks the diversity of um, natural products because it's very difficult to synthesize the complex uh, structure of naturally occurring compounds. And therefore, if we can derive lots of compounds from natural products, 
they'll have uh, different complex uh, chemical structures and which could be a source of new drugs. So these are why um, natural products are still attractive for drug discovery, um, even though if it has got disadvantages. Okay. So let's look at some examples. Let us look at some drugs which are available now, but which are derived from plants. So these drugs are currently official in the uh, pharmacopoeia, okay, which is the kind of book containing all the uh, approved drugs in a particular jurisdiction. So let's look at uh, the most uh, famous of them, which is uh, morphine. Okay, so morphine is a centrally acting analgesic. Okay, so it's a very, very potent painkiller. Um, it is called centrally acting because it acts in the brain. Okay. Whereas if we've got uh, another painkiller like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like uh, acetaminophen, that is peripherally acting, okay, so meaning it's acting, uh, it's not acting in the um, uh, brain specifically, okay. Though it acts on the hypothalamus to reduce fever, okay. But its analgesic effect um, is as an anti-inflammatory agent in the periphery. Okay. So the analgesic action would be, it is not centrally mediated, okay, but its anti-inflammatory, I mean, anti-pyretic effect is centrally mediated, okay, in case of NSAIDs. Okay. So, NSAIDs, what's the example we talked about? Let's say aspirin. Okay, it has got analgesic effect, anti-inflammatory effect, anti-pyretic effect. Okay, so the anti-pyretic effect is is uh, centrally mediated, whereas the anti-inflammatory and analgesic effect is uh, peripherally. Okay. Okay. So morphine. What is morphine? It is the. Uh, it is obtained from. from opium. Okay, so what is opium then? Opium is basically the dried latex uh, which is again obtained from the, which is in turn obtained from the seed capsules of, what is the scientific name of opium? It's from the opium poppy. Um, it is Papaver somniferum. Okay, Papaver somniferum is the scientific. This is an S. Okay, somniferum is the scientific name of opium. So it is uh, obtained from the dried latex. Okay, um, but we said that uh, these plants have got certain problems, issues related to availability in commercial quantities. Now, morphine does not have this problem. Why? Because it is cultivated okay, in uh, commercial quantities in uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan in the um, areas of the Golden Triangle which is the gold areas of the Golden Triangle. What are the countries that make up the Golden Triangle? It is Burma, Thailand, and Laos. Okay. Uh, so Burma and Laos have got lots of acreage under cultivation. Okay. Um, under cultivation. They are cultivating lots of quantities of papaver somniferum. Thailand, not so much. And uh, the other source is India, there is, there is Mexico, 
Okay, so these countries are producing lots of quantities of um, Pepavir somniferum. Therefore, um, it's easy to derive, easy and cheaper to derive morphine from the natural product. Okay, but um, can it be synthesized? Yes, it can be synthesized. But the problem is, it is it does not make economic sense to synthesize it. Okay. As of now, it's being obtained from the opium. Okay. Um, let's take another example. So we have uh, example number one. Let's look at another example. Okay. Let's look at uh, this example. It could be um, another drug. Let's say THC. Okay. So that is tetrahydro. Cannabinol. Okay. So, what is uh, tetrahydrocannabinol? Um, this is a lipid chemically and it is the active. Mm, sorry. It is the active uh, psychoactive principle. The active psychoactive principle of uh, what is the source of tetrahydrocannabinol? It is the plant cannabis sativa. Okay. So it is a lipid, it's the active psychoactive principle of this particular uh, plant. Now, THC is um, indicated in. Uh, neurological disorders okay. which can be um, an example say multiple sclerosis okay. sclerosis or neurodegenerative disorders like uh, which are the famous ones yes Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, Son's disease, and there is Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So this drug is now being tried out for neuro neurological disorders, um, and again. Cannabis is grown in almost all the tropical countries because it requires a higher temperature to um, grow and thrive. Um, yeah, so this drug is sourced from cannabis. Okay. Now let's look at, so these are uh, the two drugs which are currently obtained from plants. Okay. So they are derived from plants. So let's look at uh, some drugs which are derived from animals. Okay, uh, drugs derived from animal sources. Okay, um, what examples can we start with? Let's say it's from pigs, okay, let's look at, which are derived from pigs, okay, so that could be another number. So the first one we look at, drugs which are derived from pigs. Um, so pigs, technically we say poor sign source. Okay, and what are the examples? Uh, example, Let's look at examples. Um, let's begin with heparin. Okay, so what is heparin? Um, in fact, there are drugs like heparin. Let's write, list them down, then talk about it. Taltiparin, okay, and oxaparin.
So these are basically anticoagulants, okay. Okay, so this anticoagulants, heparin, daltaparin, and enoxaparin, they are derived from uh, porcine source. And then there are certain enzymes. Let's list uh, enzymes like uh, amylase, um, lipase, protease, and uh, pancrelipase. Okay, so these are enzymes which are used as a replacement for the digestive enzymes. Now they are also derived from porcine sources. Okay, so that's another um, set of uh, examples. Then there is uh, um, there are certain hemostatic agents. Let's look at some hemostatic agents. So there is uh, coagulation factors like uh, antithrombin 3 okay. and there are factors like uh, 2, 5, 7, 9, and 10. These are mm, hemostatic agents. Okay. So what are hemostatic agents? They are used to prevent bleeding. But in this um, example, they are derived from, uh, they are drugs which are derived from uh, the porcine source. Um, then we have certain vaccines like uh, human rotavirus. So these vaccines are also derived from um, porcine sources. Okay. Uh, let's look at, uh, okay, so the first one was from pigs. Let's look at uh, the second one, second animal. Let's look at the second animal. And uh, the second animal could be a horse. And let's, um, what's the technical um, term that we use for horse? It's equine. Okay, so what's the, what uh, drugs are derived from the horse? Let's look. Okay, the horse could be, um, the examples of drugs are conjugated. Estrogens. Okay, so basically, this conjugated estrogens are derived from the urine of, let's write somewhere down, uh, from the urine of pregnant mares. Okay, so this is used in the treatment of um, anti fertility, uh, they are basically fertility agents. Okay. Um, there is another same, a similar uh, hormone that's derived from horses, which is medroxy progesterone acetate. Okay, again. Then the most famous one is basically anti venoms. Okay. Polyvalent, multivalent uh, anti venom preparations. Now they are also prepared in the horse. Now the question is anti venom. Okay, it's basically an antibody that is produced in the horse. Now the question is why can't we use a smaller animal, say like a mouse? Um, the reason is that horse has got a large volume of 
blood. Okay, so if, you, if an animal has got large volume of blood, then larger volumes can be bled out from the animal without causing harm to the animal. And if you get a large volume, that means you get large amount of antivenom. So definitely an animal with uh, a large volume of blood would be the preferred source. Okay. So let's look at uh, another animal. Let's look at number three. Let's uh, right. uh, sheep. So, one of the most famous drugs that is derived from sheep is uh, the digoxin binding antibody. Okay, so this is called digibind. Okay, for the treatment of digitalis toxicity. Okay, but this is produced in the sheep. So the sheep is injected with digoxin and it produces antibody against it. Again, similar to that from the horse, it is bled and the antibody is separated and purified and then um, dispensed. Okay, so sheep, now the source of drugs, I mean drugs which are derived from the sheep. Okay, let's look at uh, Mm, uh, the bovine sources. Okay. Uh, this is number four. Okay, so drugs derived from bovine sources, which is basically the cow family. And we have drugs like uh, lactobacillus. which is basically uh, digestive, okay? It is meant to replace the endogenous flora. And there is uh, bovine colostrum, okay, which is basically the uh, first milk that comes out uh, when the animal gives birth. Um, again, this is again a digestive supplement. It's a source of nutrition. Then there is isophane insulin. Okay. And also neutral insulin. Yeah, this is derived from uh, bovine source. And then there is collagen. Collagen. So that's all derived from um, the the bow. It's a bovine source. Let's look at the next. Uh, sorry, the fifth um, source we are going to look at um, animal cells. Okay. So, what was the example we talked about? What did we say about that? Um, we said that uh, the cells of animals or plants can also serve as a source of drugs. Now, and we talked about the example of Chinese hamster ovary, and we asked uh, to hold on to that thought. And now we are going to come to examples of drugs that are derived from the Chinese hamster. So let's uh, write it as HO, okay, mm, which is Chinese hamster ovary cells. Okay. And what are the drugs here? Um, the drugs are, again, let's look at a hemostatic agent. Alpha. Okay, so this is hemostatic. 
and let's look at uh, a hematopoietic drug which is darbe darbe poetin that is hemostatic and an anti neoplastic drug which is derived again it is a monoclonal antibody bevacizumab okay so from the name itself mab refers to monoclonal antibody and the drug itself is anti neoplastic so it's used against tumors And then there is an enzyme laronidase okay so this is again an enzyme replacement this is an enzyme okay so those are drugs which are derived from the chinese hamster ovary let's look at some drugs which are derived from mouse cells let's look at number 6 okay mouse scientific term being murine source okay um murine source could be basically mouse is used uh to produce monoclonal antibodies okay so there are certain drugs uh let's give example uh right tuximab again it's a monoclonal antibody um and it is again a anti neoplastic and then there is another drug abscis map again a monoclonal antibody but it has got an effect as an anticoagulant okay and um, yeah so the cells let's go back again to the the source of drugs there okay so we said that it can be cells which are derived from plants and animals so these cells are basically used in tissue culture okay okay and um, one of the animal cells is also eggs okay so egg is again an animal cell so the egg can also be a source of drugs so let's look at what uh, the drugs which are derived from eggs let's label it as seven and say egg okay x basically and the uh, viral vaccines okay so we have the influenza vaccine the rabies vaccine okay so these are produced in eggs technical name for sheep this oh right okay bovine is basically the cow family okay the bovide family okay. all right so there are a few drugs which have been discovered in okay so some drugs are uh, let's write it as a note 
Okay, some drugs are discovered So some drugs are discovered in natural products. Okay, but after discovery, it is commercially synthesized biotechnologically. Okay, um, then it is synthesized bio. So biotechnological drugs are large molecule drugs. So we'll, we'll say what are large molecule drugs. Um, just hold on to that thought again. Okay, so they are synthesized biotechnology. Let's look at an example. The very famous drug is ziconotide. So this drug was initially derived from the toxin of a cone snail. Okay, what was this specific cone snail's name? Conus magus. Okay, Conus magus toxin. It was initially derived. And the importance of this drug is it is about thousand times more potent than morphine. Okay, so it's indicated for, therefore it's not indicated for all the cases. It is only indicated in chronic. What is chronic? Which has been present for a long time. Chronic pain which is intractable to other analgesics. Okay, so this drug is administered intrathecally. Okay. And it is basically for this very, very severe pain which cannot be controlled by other analgesic drugs. Okay. So this is an example of drugs which are discovered in natural products but later on synthesized biotechnologically. So the naturals, it is the it is not no more derived from the cone snail. Okay, it's basically a peptide. So if it's a peptide, it can be made uh, biosynthetically in a uh, biotechnology in a uh, organism, microorganism. Okay. Um, so we have covered what have we covered? We have covered the drugs which are derived from natural products. Okay. So the other natural product, um, the other natural source is mineral sources. Okay. So what minerals are we talking about? Uh, minerals like, uh, um, let's use another pen. Okay. What are the minerals? Let's look at um, aluminium, hydroxide. Okay, it's got uh, it's a trivalent ion. Aluminium is a trivalent ion. So aluminium hydroxide is basically an antacid. Okay, it's, it's acts as an antacid. So it's used for the treatment of acidity. Um, what about magnesium sulfate? Another example would be magnesium sulfate. Okay. So aluminum hydroxide. This is magnesium sulfate. Again, it's used as an antacid, but other than that, it has got it is used to treat preeclampsia preeclampsia um, so what is preeclampsia this is the 
uh, hypertension and uh, proteinuria. Okay, which is seen in pregnant women. Okay, in pregnant. Okay. Uh, so it is also used to treat. So it is an antacid as well as it is also used in preeclampsia to reduce hypertension. So that's another use of magnesium sulfate and that is a mineral source. Yeah. So now let us look at drugs which are having a, which are semi-synthetically derived. Okay. We're talking about semi-synthetic, okay, semi-synthetically derived from natural source. So what is uh, what are semi-synthetic drugs? These are drugs which are chemically modified okay, modified from from naturally occurring there are uh, chemically modified from naturally occurring starting materials. Okay. Starting materials um, um, which are basically the starting materials are from natural products. Okay. So okay. from naturally occurring written that. Okay, so what are they? They are drugs which are chemically modified from naturally occurring starting materials. Do we have examples? We certainly do. Okay, so there are. Let's look at an example. Hmm. The example is Paclitax. So this was again initially discovered uh, in a plant. What's the name of the plant? Taxus brevifolia. Okay. okay. Um, so now it is semi-synthetically derived from cells, uh, which are derived from taxus brevifolia. They are used in cell culture. And from that cell culture, paclitaxel is derived semi-synthetically. Okay, so what is paclitaxel used for? It's an anti-cancer drug. Okay, so it's used for the treatment of um, breast, lung, and. Uh, uh, non-small cell uh, cancers, okay. So it's an anti-neoplastic drug again. Yeah. Um, what are the other examples? Other examples are basically the uh, antibiotic derivatives, okay. Um, um, what antibiotics? We have the tetracycline analogs um, and we have erythromycin. Mycin analogs, lincomycin analogs. Chloramphenicol analogs. Um, and uh, amino glycoside derivatives. Okay, amino glycosides. Okay. 
So tetracycline analogs, erythromycin analogs, lincomycin analogs, chloramphenicol analogs, and aminoglycoside um, uh, drugs are derived uh, semi-synthetically. Okay, so this list is not very comprehensive. So we have given the most common examples out here. Okay. So the other um, uh, semi-synthetically derived drugs are basically biologicals. Okay. Um, the example that is very common. So biologicals are basically drugs which are derived from biotechnology, biotechnological sources. The definition, as I said, just hold on to that thought, we'll come back to it. So example would be insulin. Okay, so uh, let's say specifically humulin. Okay, human insulin. So that is again a semi-synthetic process. Okay. So we'll come to um, synthetic drugs. Okay. So synthetic drugs, mm, let's take another color. So synthetic drugs, um, they form the majority drugs which are currently used. Okay? They are usually small molecules. Okay? So by small molecules, we mean they have a molecular weight which is less than 1,000 Daltons. Okay? So the average would be about around uh, 600 Dalton. Okay? So that is their molecular weight. Um, so they are small molecule drugs. So which brings us to the definition of biologicals. Okay. So biologicals are large molecules. When we say large molecules, we mean they are having a molecular weight greater than thousand Dalton. So most because of this reason, most of them are administered parenterally. Okay. So the small molecule drugs, they are mostly given orally. Okay, so the most, they are mostly given, mm, commonly given per oral. Okay, per oral, commonly. Commonly administered per or what could be the examples of uh, these drugs? The examples could be, let's take a familiar example, acetaminophen. Okay, so what is this? This is an analgesic antipyretic. Analgesic antipyretic. Okay. Uh, let's take an NSAID like um, acetyl salicylic acid. Okay, it's commonly called um, aspirin. And what effect has it got? It's an analgesic antipyretic anti-inflammatory. So again, it's a uh, small molecule which is synthesized and uh, is synthesized. Another example could be frucimide. Okay, so this is a diuretic drug. Okay, it's a diuretic. Okay, so that's used uh, to manage, uh, say, edema or hypotension. Yeah, frucimide and diazepam. 
This is an anti-epileptic, anti-convulsant. It's an anti-convulsant drug. So these drugs are um, synthesized. Okay, let's look at some newer drugs. Because most of the modern uh, new molecules, um, they are synthesized. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Iravacycline. Okay, so this is basically a tetracycline analog. Okay, it's a tetracycline. Okay. And then there is a drug called uh, Fosravuconazole. It's a very long name. L lysine um, ethanolate. Okay, so what is this? This is basically. A broad spectrum antifungal drug. Okay, it's an antifungal agent. Okay. Um, let's look at another drug. Balax. Beloxavir okay. uh, is used for the treatment of, of influenza A and B. Okay. Um, yeah, so those are the newer drugs. So the, the point is most of the newer drugs, which are small molecules, are um, produced by chemical synthesis. So, we have talked about the different sources of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Okay. So, having said all, uh, having learned these things, there are certain things that as healthcare professionals, we should be aware. Okay. So the first thing that, let's write it again as a note. As healthcare providers, we have to know that uh, the API may be synthetic. Okay. But in the medicine, the excipients may be derived from may be derived uh, from natural products okay they may be derived from um, natural products um, shall we give an example okay example would be gelatin okay now gelatin is um, used in the manufacture of capsule shells right but this gelatin itself is derived from um, it can be derived from uh, different animal sources like uh, it can be derived from the ox sheep pigs etc okay so what is so gelatin is derived from the connective tissue Okay, from the connective tissue, tissue which can be the bones and skins of the, these animals, from the bones and skins. Skins of these animals, okay. So, the capsule may be synthetic, okay. The active ingredient may be synthetic. Okay, now in the capsule. Okay, so let's um, um, uh, 
give an example. Say there is a capsule, Rosalind MPC. Okay, so let's, maybe that's a trade name. Okay, so let's write it as a trade name. Okay, now this drug, the active ingredient is basically MPC, but it is a capsule. And because it's a capsule, that capsule is made up of gelatin, and that is an animal product. Okay? All right, so why is this important? Why should we as healthcare providers even care about this? Okay? So the reason is um, that if we know this, um, um, we would be able to address the queries about uh, the medicine from our clients, which are basically patients, okay? Um, um, with respect to to their religious beliefs, or their um, dietary preferences. Okay. Also, this, um, so the first one is A, let's say. Also, the excipients derived from natural products may be allergic to the patient, okay? So maybe may cause allergies, okay? So uh, a careful history and then looking into the, the excipients of the prescribed drug can mitigate uh, problems or some um, interventions can be undertaken. Okay. So that is the one thing that we need to keep in mind. The other thing is um, we must be aware so let's write this as B. Okay. So we should be aware as healthcare professionals, we should be aware um, that natural products are potent. Okay. Meaning, they may interfere, they may cause uh, a drug interaction with the um, drugs that are prescribed. Okay, and uh, why should we be aware? It is because the patients, our clients, I'm sorry, let me just fix this. So our uh, clients may be consuming these natural products as dietary supplements. Okay? They may be consuming these natural products as dietary supplements. So as healthcare providers, while well, we take a history, we need to ask our clients whether they are consuming any dietary supplements. And then we need to look into the constituents of the dietary supplement and see whether it can cause potential drug interactions. Okay, so, um, um, uh, so the third thing that as healthcare providers we need to be aware 
is that drugs derived from from animals Ooh, sorry oops so for some reasons this software has got stuck fix it so the drugs derived from animals may cause allergy allergy in the patient so the patients can become sensitized to the excipients which are derived from uh, natural products especially from animal sources So these are the three important things that as healthcare providers we need to keep in mind okay um